so this is what it's all about is recovering your visual abilities after brain injury. And uh, I think it's important to talk about what the purpose of a visual system is first. And is this coming up for you here? Let's see. Yep. Okay. So the basic idea here is that the, the purpose of having a visual system is to detect and derive meaning from light. So it's not just the ability to see clearly, which is important, but it's the ability to derive meaning and to, to, to detect light and have it have a purposeful, have it have value for you. So that's the real important thing here when it comes to vision is to detect light. And then the second most important thing here is to plan and direct the intelligent movement of the body. So the purpose of that visual system is to detect light, to derive meaning from that light, and to plan and direct movement based on that light. So we can plan movement in order to, to engage in future activities and to respond to the uh, contingencies that are available in our environment. So um, the role there is, you could think of it as survival, you know, in a physical dynamic world that's, that's immersed in gravity, and that's critical. But it also has to do with uh, planning, uh, being able to plan the future uh, based on past and present events and to plan future possibilities. So uh, the visual system ties together this temporal awareness of where you've been, where you are, where you're going with previously experienced uh, uh, experiences that help you guide yourself through those activities. So <clears throat> clarity, like I said, is important. Eye movement control is important. Eye health is important but the visual skills necessary for human performance go far beyond the ability to see clearly and to have healthy eyes. And so we'll talk about some of those things that are really important for uh, human visual activity. So there's something called the sight pathway. There's these different pathways that we have that come into the brain. There's about 30 of them. And if you, if you realize that two thirds of all the nerves that come into the brain come from the eyes. So there's 3 million nerves that come into the brain, uh, 2 million come from the eyes. So it's a, the nervous system is given extreme dominance to the visual experience. So um, half of the cranial nerves are dedicated to vision. There's 12 cranial nerves that are involved in the visual system, being able to coordinate the body and the brain and the, and the environment that you're in. And half of those cranial nerves are dedicated to vision. So some of what part of the, some of these 30 pathways I've listed here on the screen and one's the sight pathway the one that we typically think of in terms of what we see and experience but there's also what's called a blind sight pathway this is a pathway that does not even go to our occipital lobe the part of our brain that we think of when we see but it's the part of our brain that sets up a, a spatial construct inside of which we ultimately become conscious it's a it's a part of the brain that sets us up for being prepared for the visual events that are about to occur in our visual world. <clears throat> and that's a, a huge pathway. It makes up about 15% of all the nerves that come into the brain. It prepares us for movement, and it prepares us for thinking. The vestibular ocular reflex, and this is a pathway that goes to the vestibular system, and it enables us to move our body and move our head and not lose visual connectivity with our environment. So, if that pathway is disrupted, then what happens is when we move our head side to side, our eyes don't stay in constant contact with that environment. And that's happening at the level of the midbrain. This needs to really be established well through all variety of vestibular and visual activities in dynamic three-dimensional space to reestablish that connection so that when an individual does have disruption, they can recapture that ability and confidently move again through space without having that sense of apprehension or uncertainty about where their body is in space and where they need to move throughout space. Uh, there's three other uh, pathways that I wanna talk about. One's called the dorsal stream, which was the how-to pathway, and the, which is the how-to, meaning when you look at something, how is it that you're gonna move your body to get to that object? Uh, the ventral stream is more of what is it? It's the pathway that it splits from the occipital lobe ventrally to the lower part of the brain and connects with the temporal lobe and parietal lobes for determining not only how to, but what is it that we're looking at. And then the ocular motor pathways, these are the pathways that help us keep our eyes aligned to keep us from seeing double vision. I, I know that one of you here certainly has double vision. 
And so this pathway has probably been disrupted and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So these various pathways through the brain are really critical and you can see how they just course right through the middle brain. There's literally one neuron between the, uh, the eye and the occipital lobe. There's one, what, there's one synapse, excuse me, that connects those two. So it's such a quick and fast pathway to the brain because it's critical for not only performance, but for survival as well. Uh, this diagram here just shows you the complexity. Actually, this diagram is about 20 years old, so it's much more complex now than it, than it was thought to be. So all these various pathways going through the brain are connecting literally to every aspect of the brain, temporal lobe, frontal lobe, cerebellum, midbrain, all aspects of human performance run through the visual pathway for reference and guidance as to uh, arranging for optimal visual performance. <clears throat> so I'd like to talk about some common and maybe not so common visual problems that occur after acquired brain injury. I'm going to talk about several different things today. Uh, and so binocular dysfunction, this is where we have issues with eye alignment resulting in double vision or loss of depth perception. Either one can be really devastating because they happen suddenly. There's a sudden onset of your world being double or there's a sudden onset of your world being flat. Both of them can cause significant apprehension and insecurity and dysfunction or difficulty in engaging in dynamic three-dimensional space. There's accommodative dysfunction. This is where it's difficult to change your focus from far to near or from near to far. So your distance vision might be clear, but your close vision might be blurry and or vice versa. You might not be able to shift your focus back and forth. So your world is intermittently blurry. Uh, then the third here, area here is ocular motor dysfunction. This is where the eyes no longer follow the directive of your brain or of your frontal lobe. Your, your executive function doesn't allow the eyes to move when and where they should be moving or where they're directed. Now, the eyes are the only part of our brains that we can physically move around. You know, they're the very front part of our brain. So when you look at somebody's eyes, you're literally looking at the front part of their brain. And it's the only part of the brain we can literally move around. So when we choose to direct our brain or our attention to various parts of our environment, that's critical for our sense of uh, spatial security and our ability to sequence and to do sequential processing and spatial processing. When this ocular motor system is disrupted and we can't direct our attention when and where we want to, then our world is segmented, not only spatially, but also temporally. So we can't really process when things are happening in serial order. And it's very difficult also to process things in a spatial array. We can't always organize things that we would normally be able to organize in space. The third area here is nystagmus. This is often due to an injury to the brain at the level of the midbrain, and it causes the eyes to shake or wiggle, and this can be significantly disruptive to a sense of balance and also to visual clarity. Uh, fortunately, nystagmus can sometimes be treated because oftentimes there's what's called a null point, whereby when an individual looks to the left or to the right, or if they converge or look up or down, that nystagmus, that shaking, seems to subside and is subdued. So you can dampen that nystagmus by looking in certain fields of gaze. And there are prisms, there's something called yoke prisms, which I'll talk about later as well, that can provide an opportunity for that nystagmus to be more controlled if it can't be treated uh, through biofeedback or through other means. And then certainly visual information processing dysfunction can occur. When these more fundamental areas of visual engagement with the physical world are disrupted, you're spending so much more cog of your cognitive resources to engage that physical world. You have less cognitive resources available to think about and to consider when engaging in the world. So when we can eliminate these basic issues of visual connectivity with your environment, we, when we can make that more fluent and more reliable, then more of your cognitive resources become available and more visual information processing becomes available to you as well. But some of these areas of visual processing involve 
visual memory, and especially the areas of visual working memory. There's two kinds of working memory. Working memory is the ability to hold on in, to previous events, relate them to what's currently occurring right now, and then apply them to future possibilities. There's a, the visual, uh, what they call the visual spatial sketch pad, is when we can see things previously or in the past, current and future. And the phonological loop is the more laborious loop that we sometimes have to revert to if our visual processing isn't intact. And that is to circulate language through our mind to remember what we have to do. And that is very difficult to do for many people to constantly circulate words through their head in order to remember where they've been, where they are and where they're going. So when it comes to recovering from brain injury, what we try to do is reestablish through functional means and through therapy, oftentimes along with a cognitive therapist or speech and language therapist, to reestablish the, the visual spatial sketch pad and understanding when and where things are happening in our environment relative to where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. And of course, that's critical for navigating, whether it be through your house or in your neighborhood or when you're shopping or anything like that. One of the difficulties with brain injury as well, as, as some of you probably have experienced, if not knowing this, others with this problem, and that is visual field loss. The typical area is, is visual loss to one half of your visual field. And it's called homonymous hemianopsia. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And visual neglect is when the visual field is still intact, but the individual doesn't pay attention to the information on one side of their visual field. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then the visual perceptual midline shift, that's when people no longer reference the middle of their body to their visual environment. So they might think that the middle of their body is off to the side, and when they walk through space, they will misjudge where things are left and right compared to their body, and they'll look as though they're clumsy, they'll hit things, uh, and not because of a field loss, but because the, their sense of midline is no longer at their anatomical midline. We'll talk about that further as well. And we'll also talk more about some photophobia issues, that is the difficulty that people have in contending with ambient light or focal light or going from a light room to a dark room or vice versa. There's ways to manage that and to treat that. And then motion sensitivity. Many, many people with uh, concussion experience motion sensitivity and photophobia. Motion sensitivity is that situation where when people wave their hands a lot when they're talking to you or there's a ceiling fan going on or there's a, a fluorescent light that's going out and it's, and it's flickering. Uh, these kinds of things are exceedingly difficult to contend with when you have a, a disruption in the visual process secondary to a brain injury. I'm gonna talk more about these things later. Uh, you might recognize this woman here. This is Hillary Clinton. And you might recall also that she had an event at one point in time where she had a dizzy spell and she was unstable. And it was found that um, she had some double vision. And you can see here that she's using what's called a Fresnel prism in her left eye. Now, a Fresnel prism is a prism that redirects light to a different position in front of that eye. So if, the, if an eye is turned and the left eye, let's say, is looking straight ahead and the right eye is looking across this way, then the individual is going to experience double vision. They'll see what they're looking at straight ahead. They'll also see what this right eye is looking at over here and they'll have diplopia or double vision. So what the, a Fresnel prism does, you put a Fresnel prism in front of the eye and what it does is it redirects light over in front of the turned eye so that it is also looking at the same thing the straight ahead eye is. And then the brain interprets that as being single vision. Uh, so Fresnel prisms can result in immediate resolution of double vision. Uh, they can be applied for an eye that's drifting out or in or up or down. Uh, and it's, it's a wonderful solution. It's a quick and easy solution. It's very inexpensive to uh, provide an immediate resolution of double vision. And I would say probably at least 30 or 40 percent of people with double vision benefit from this type of solution immediately. A double vision sometimes is very subtle or intermittent. 
And this is a police officer that we had in vision therapy and vision rehabilitation uh, because he didn't use a prism. He could, the prism wasn't effective for him because it would, his eyes would go out of alignment in depending on which gaze he was looking in. So if he looked to the left, his eyes were lined up. If he looked to the right, the eyes weren't lined up. And so what we did with him is we worked on visual rehabilitation using stereoscopes and binocular activities to help him recover the, his own binocularity through the plasticity that's available in the brain. We can, re, we can tap into those pathways that provide an opportunity for recovery. And so this police officer was helping protect others in a, a restaurant situation where a brawl broke out and somebody hit him over the head with a, a big mug and resulted in his brain injury and his double vision. Uh, so he's working on securing and solidifying his ability to maintain three-dimensional vision through the use of vision rehabilitation. Uh, this woman here that you'll see had a, a car accident and her right eyelid is, is drooping, it's closed. And you might be able to also see eventually, I'll show this on, in the form of a video, that her right eyes turned down and out to the right. This is called a third nerve palsy. So she had a significant trauma to her face and head, and then it resulted in this third nerve palsy. She too didn't benefit from a Fresnel prism, but she did benefit from vision rehabilitation. And it's typically thought that somebody with a third nerve palsy pretty much cannot do anything about it. And you know, the eye is gonna be down and out, the eyelid's gonna be drooping forever. But what we did was in vision therapy, we taught her how to recapture control over that. So let's see if we can show that video. You'll see the right eyes out and down. Okay, now go ahead and straighten your eyes. Okay. Now she's able to keep it straight as much. Good. Now keep your eyes straight. So she okay, learned to do this. Just go back to not putting any effort into it. She has to put effort into it to be aware. But she was able to do that. Let's watch that again. You can see it. Eyes are way out of alignment. Okay, now go ahead and straighten your eyes. Now she's learned to straighten them. Don't turn up to shoot your head quite as much. Good. Now keep your eyes straight. Okay. Now just go back to not putting any effort into it. So, you know, when a prism doesn't work, a vision rehabilitation oftentimes can work. Let me talk about what's called a visual midline shift or a visual perceptual midline shift. This is a diagram over here on the right, the two eyes and the mouth there. And there's a vertical line that's right close to the nasal part of the left eye. This is what I was talking about before when sometimes people think that that vertical line that you see right there, they think that that vertical line is actually straight ahead of them, right between their eyes, right straight ahead of their nose. And when an individual feels that an object is straight ahead of them when it's really in front of one eye, that is called a visual perceptual midline shift. And they are perceived to be clumsy. They are perceived to be uh, unaware of one side of their visual field compared to the other one. In fact, they don't have a visual field loss at all. But they can't negotiate dynamic three-dimensional space because they don't reference space compared to the middle of their body. They're referencing space to a location off to their side. And so what we have to do in vision therapy and through vision rehabilitation is oftentimes use a yoked prism. Now you can do this test on your own. So if, if you watch me in the, in the screen, you can, a, an easy way to do this, although it's not as accurate as it could be, is to use a pencil and slowly move it across the visual field and have the patient, have the person you're working with look at the pencil and they should say now, right when it's straight ahead, right between their eyes, straight ahead of their nose. Now you can see that this pencil is in fact right straight ahead of me, right between my eyes, straight ahead of my nose. Now some people will actually say that it's straight ahead of them right now. And when they do that, they think that's the middle of their body. And so what we have to do is prescribe yoke prisms and vision rehabilitation to solve that. Let me show you another way of testing that. This is called a visual spatial uh, mapping board. And this individual had a brain tumor, uh, an astrocytoma, which resulted in uh, a disruption of visual space. Now there's a board up on top with these little buttons on it. 
and you can't see his hand down below that has a pen in it. And there's a piece of paper on the bottom of this board. And what he's asked to do is to make a dot on the paper that's on the bottom side of this board, right where he sees these separate dots to be. So let's watch this video. Pointed that one out, and I didn't see it. <laughs> All right, good. Now I'm going to go to the middle again. Okay, so what happens is we, we can map out his perception of space relative to the middle of his body. And notice he was able to turn his head, he can turn his eyes, because it's not about that, it's about his visual perception of space with his body and not necessarily the, his head and neck movement or his eye movements. Now, when we, when we treated him with this, you'll see what happens with um, yoga prisms. Now, this is when he was walking without yoga prisms down a hallway. You'll see how apprehensive he is and how insecure he is in terms of walking through this space. Now, keep in mind, he has 20-20 eyesight, and that's not a problem. Good, then come on back. And his physical eyes are healthy. He's very insecure, and this was a, he is a fighter pilot in the Navy, so he's very athletic. Very good. Okay, now if we watch what happens when we put on prisms, it's an immediate resolution of that. You can see his confidence and movement, his ability to negotiate the space and the free-flowing bilateral control of his body. And that was literally within, you know, 10 seconds of putting on yoke prisms, he was able to recover function. Not, now, it's a compensation, a compensation, that's for sure. And that's why he also was involved in vision rehabilitation. I want to also show you a rather dramatic example of what can happen with concussion and the resultant visual midline shift. What you'll see is a hockey player and you'll see it right in the lower right hand part of your screen, right around center ice. You'll see a, a hockey player get hit from behind and sustain a concussion. Uh, then you, what you'll see is what it was like for him after the concussion. And then you'll see what it was like for him after he was given yoked prism. So let's take a look at this video. Let me go back a little bit. If I can. Sorry, hold on one second. So he sustained a concussion quite dramatically and you'll see what it's like for him when he has to walk. This is from a uh, colleague of mine, Dr. Patrick Quaid. He has a visual midline shift. He perceives his body to be in a different position in space relative to the middle of his body. You might see that he thinks his body is further to the right than it really is. Now keep in mind, there's nothing wrong with his legs. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the, the musculature of his body. It's a neurological insult to his visual perception of space. And again, this is also at the level of the midbrain. Now when we put yoke prisms on, this is, this is about 10 seconds later, or 10 minutes later, he put the prisms on. And you can see, that his brain in his visual system is providing better neurological input to his body, enabling him to negotiate gravity and space much more effectively. So the yoke prisms were a segue into him recovering better function. Then he went through vision rehabilitation. He spent about 20, sessions of vision therapy 
you know, vision rehabilitation, and now he's doing this without yoke prisms. He can walk much more confidently in space. So yoke prisms are a pretty powerful tool and a very important segue into ultimate resolution of uh, visual, visual perceptual midline shifts from brain injury. Uh, but also sometimes they have to remain as a constant compensation. And much of the time people can wean themselves from them and function pretty well. So another area of visual difficulty from brain injury is the homonymous hemianopsia. That's where an individual can't see to one side of their visual field. Sometimes people make the mistake of saying that it's the, in this particular case, that it's the right eye that can't see, but it's really neither eye can see to its right. So each eye can see to the left of where their eyes are pointed, but neither eye can see to the right of where each eye is pointed. And so how do we treat that? And I'll show you how we generally treat that. So you can see here, there's a, um, a Fresnel prism in the pair of glasses in this woman's right lens. It's right above her line of sight. And so her, her, her right eye is looking just below the prism, but the prism is moving light from her right visual field across over into her intact left visual field. And so when she is negotiating space, she is able to function better. Now sometimes we will put a prism in both the top and bottom part of the visual field. So the eye is in the middle and it can scan left and right. It has the ability to completely engage the physical world left and right. But the imagery coming from the top or the bottom is moved over into the intact right visual field to signal to that patient that there is something going on that needs to be attended to, and then the individual can look right at that um, information. So here's an example of how that looks, where you have a prism on the top and you have a prism on the bottom that provides an opportunity for awareness. So it's really a field awareness prism. It's not a field expanding prism or a field recovery prism, but it provides awareness of information that would otherwise not be seen in the left visual field and it moves it over to the intact right visual field. Now, when we do vision rehabilitation, we will use various techniques. This happens to be what's called an AccuVision board. So you can kind of see what we do here in, re and in regards to sports. In my sports vision training, I was gonna say, we use this with sports too. Uh, a lot of our Padre baseball players use this uh, equipment in our office. But the, um, for homonymous hemianopsia, this individual is working on becoming aware of targets in his visual field to ensure that he doesn't um, neglect any of them when they come up. So he can obtain better and better scores over time. So we can, we can determine his reaction time to various parts of his visual field, obviously critically important for activities such as driving, uh, walking through crowded spaces, shopping, things of that nature. Let's talk a little bit about visual neglect. So visual neglect is where we don't have a visual field loss, but we do have inattention to one part of the visual field. Now in this particular situation, uh, this individual has difficulty with being coming aware of his right hand. And so what we've done, this is the out of the work of V.S. Ramachandran at UCSD Neurosciences Laboratory and Cognition Laboratory. And he has come up with some wonderful techniques using mirrors. This is one of his techniques where the right hand is inside of a box. You, you might be able to see that box. There's a hole in the box uh, that his right hand's inside of. Hold in his right hand, you can't see his right hand because it's inside the box. What looks like his right hand is really the image of his left hand. And so, when he's moving his left hand, he looks into the mirror and it's perceived as though his right hand is moving. He can't move his right hand very effectively. He tends to neglect that side. But when he starts to initiate movement with his left hand and he sees his right hand, what he perceives his right hand to start moving, it begins stimulating 
spatial awareness to that visual field. And it also begins stimulating awareness of the ability to move that right arm. So it's providing an opportunity for him to become aware of the right side of his body through visual imagery that's provided for and stimulated by his intact left side, his left hand, while looking to a mirror. So this is a wonderful technique that's been shown to be very helpful for lots of people. Uh, we use a similar technique for those with autism who, who we might think have difficulty with mirror neurons where they can't really um, appreciate the intentions of others. So we put a half silver, silver mirror in between ourselves and that child and we engage in activities so they can actually see themselves reflected onto us and they begin to appreciate um, that ability to understand the intentions of others. But that's a different topic. But this is for visual neglect through vision rehabilitation. Now photophobia and motion sensitivity is, is a big issue. Like I said, especially with those with acquired brain injury from concussion. Uh, because it's a global injury and that global injury disrupts all variety of pathways to the brain like i mentioned before there's about 30 different pathways probably more than 30 pathways now from the vision from the eyes into the brain and throughout the brain and that disruption really results in significant issues with movement and light so many people find that using a sunglass that's very complete uh, this pair of sunglasses here has a a covering on the top, side shields. It's not as low as I'd like it to be, um, but this is a kind of lens that's not even as dark as many people like to be able to recover a sense of engagement in a normal lit room. And so sometimes we have to have a very specific color that is specific to that individual's needs. There's various disruptions of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system and these the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system in the brain respond differently to different colors of light so we use something called colorimetry which is a form of syntonics that's enabling people to recover a balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems and so we test that with colorimetry and we come up with a tint and a density that's optimal for that particular individual it's based a lot on their pupillary responses to light and their ability to contend with light. So um, this is a pretty good pair of sunglasses for that. Could be a little darker. He could also be wearing a hat. Now, people with photophobia should consider wearing a hat indoors to protect themselves from obligatory fluorescent lights or fans that might be moving. To, and on the bottom side of that hat should be black instead of white so as to minimize bounced light reflections off the bottom of the bill of the hat. So that would be ideal. Um, so a, a, a hat, sunglasses that are dark can be very helpful as a com compensation to photophobia. But as they improve through vision rehabilitation and through some nutritional interventions sometimes, uh, and other types, of, other professionals that can help out with this too, we, we want to use a team approach and so we can slowly um, migrate them into less and less density of light, maybe a change in the color of the filter. And uh, you might recognize this individual. Uh, different colors do different things for different people. And so uh, think of it that way. It's a very specific uh, prescription of a very specific tint of a very specific density and with very controlled lighting. So in order to control lighting, uh, you have to think about the quality of the light. You have to think about, is it an incandescent bulb that you're looking, uh, that's in your environment? Is it fluorescent? Is it LED? Is it halogen? And so after you determine what light source is optimal for you, most people don't like the fluorescent uh, because oftentimes they flicker. Uh, even if they don't flicker to those without a brain injury, those of us with a brain injury can see that flicker much easier because we can't summate the, the dark light cycles that are occurring in a typical fluorescent frequency. And so we can actually see that flicker, even if the light bulb's new, you can actually hear the hum of a light bulb as well, for the same reasons we can see the flicker of a light bulb, because we can't summate those sensory impulses that enter the brain uh, very quickly. 
So control the lighting, control the, the light source, control the, the brightness of the light, control the color of the light. So uh, some people like kind of a soft white, other people like cool light. It really depends. So if you, uh, if you like a soft light color, you're gonna wanna get something that's called around 38, 3500 Kelvin. Uh, if you like the bluish light, you're gonna go for something like a 42, Bro, what the heck, bro, bro, what the heck, so, my penis, man. Control the light, control the quality of the light. Control the quality Also control of the, the light. environmental control patterns control that are in the light, pa- that are in your environment, such as the pattern and uh, the static patterns of the, oh, the carpet patterns that you see, the wallpaper patterns that you see, and the movement that takes place in your environment. If you can control those things, you're much better off. Uh, also, again, we've talked about lenses and prisms and filters and then vision rehabilitation for those things as well. So this boy here to the right in that picture, you can see um, he's a nonverbal patient uh, that finds tremendous benefit from that, from that tint. You can see the smile on his face. That's what occurred when he put those lenses on. You can see they're very protective in terms of his peripheral vision. They're of a very specific tint that we tested and determined what was optimal for him. So other things to consider, um, bolster your visual physiology, okay? And this means use the proper nutrition. Now, omega-3s, the EPA and the DHA and the triglyceride form are the most absorbent forms that you can get. These are neuroprotective nutrients. They decrease inflammation and they enhance the quality of the transmission of neurons in the brain. Also use lutein, zeaxanthin, and especially mesozeaxanthin to bolster the pigment in the eye that contends with light. We, we don't get nearly the uh, amount of healthy nutrients to provide these kinds of pigments in the eye. And so it's really interesting. routine I know, I know. that people need supplements in this area to build up the pigment necessary Eric, in the brain me, and in the Eric. eye to contend with artificial light, especially those of us that are on the computer, much more than we'd like to do. So solidify and synchronize visual and vestibular connection. This is, this is where we talk about collaborating with other professionals, especially those that work with the, the vestibular Eric system. Eric Whitney, Eric Whitney. Okay. Reestablish your visual skills through visual rehabilitation. Reestablish it through visual. And finally, I want to talk about just the critical importance of seeking a team of professionals who are willing to collaborate. Most of you with brain injury have had the experience of working with several different isolated professionals that don't seem to communicate with each other or certain professionals pretty much are in isolation from other professionals that are working with you. So create a bridge of communication, work with various professionals that will work together with you because there's no one professional that can take care of all of your needs and professionals recognize this the brain's far too complex for one individual to take care of everything so that's my message to you is to consider really working and collaborating with a team of professionals and depending on your symptoms these are the people that i would talk i I would consider engaging with certainly rehabilitative optometry that's what i've been talking about occupational therapy Think of the occupations that you are involved in in your daily activities, whether it be eating or driving or reading or cooking. Uh, Occupational therapists are fantastic in being able to help people with that. Uh, Physical therapy, those with physical injuries that need increased mobility and integration with their vestibular system, critically important. Uh, Speech and language pathology, they are the professionals that help you re-engage the the linguistic aspects of your injury, whether it be written language or spoken language. And certainly those that work with cognitive rehab are going to integrate with speech and language professionals to reestablish all variety of working memory and all variety of uh, executive functions for planning and for determining what's most important to do first and to organize your day. Psychology, of course, is critically important for those that are obviously having issues with um, the emotional turmoil and the the anxiety that results from a brain injury. And also we have neurootology. Uh, This is a neurologist that is specializing in the vestibular function 
and its relationship to the body and the brain and the visual system and ensuring that there's integrity between those systems so that these other professionals can do their work in reestablishing coherence between them. A nutritional specialist, whether it be a dietitian or other nutritional uh, specialist, should certainly be a part of the plan here in regards to recovery. Uh, there's things that can cause all variety of issues post injury that didn't cause problems before. And there's nutritional considerations that will really bolster your recovery. Osteopathy, extremely important as well. They maintain the integrity of the, the, the brain inside the skull and the dura matter that travels all up and down your, your back, ensuring that all the nutrients from the brain flow out so all the metabolic debris can be circulated and all the nutritional components of the cerebral spinal fluid can flow to all parts of the body and brain exceedingly important chiropractic there's all variety of chiropractors and depending on your particular needs you want to seek out a professional that has expertise in various areas of chiropractic and then finally i mentioned something that maybe some people don't think about and that's podiatry you know the foot is the primary contact we have with the earth when we're walking or with our physical, the ground itself. And the proprioceptive nature of that foot, its sensory abilities, its motor abilities are all critical because that input from the foot goes all the way up into the body and then the brain has to consider what the feet are doing in order to then secure a confident relationship with the space around that person. So. If I were to create a dream team of people to help you with your uh, brain injury, it'd be this group of people right here. Now, I might've missed some, but these individuals here should all be able to refer you to those in the, on the list that you might not have had an opportunity to, to reach out to and to work with. So please consider all these individuals when it comes to your recovery. So it's really a team approach to uh, recovery. And so, you kind of need a, a gatekeeper to do that. And so we, we can do that for you, certainly. And I think anyone on that list that really has a professional perspective of collaboration can also do that for you. So I'd like to be able to um, take any questions uh, that anyone might have in regards to what I've talked about. And so let's go ahead and do that if, if people would like to do that. Okay. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll open things up uh, here now for anybody that uh, has questions of Dr. Hillier, and thank you so much for that comprehensive presentation. It's really good information. Um, and so, if you know how to raise your hand, uh, what I'll do is it's helpful if you keep yourselves muted um, until you're called on. But if you know how to raise your hand. Um, I'll call on you. If you don't, uh, you could just physically raise your hand. I have a hand raised with Meredith. Meredith, uh, go ahead. I'm going to unmute you right now. So there you go. You should be. Go ahead and unmute. Okay. You go. Um, I just want to thank you, by the way, doctor, for all that information. I took like five pages of notes. <laughs> You're welcome. Because um, they don't tell you about the importance of of vision and the brain when you have a brain injury nobody mentioned that to me till 20 years later so i appreciate all your information i wish i had a care team like that um it's hard to get but i was wondering what um if you can explain osteopathy a little more it, i know it has to do with met metabolic uh changes well, osteopathy. yeah there's different um like within all of our professions. So I'm a rehabilitative optometrist. And yeah. so, you know, there's different kinds of optometrists. There's behavioral optometrists, there's developmental optometry, you know, so within osteopathy, it's, it, there's a similar uh, diversity in professional emphasis. And so the, the type of osteopath I'm talking about is the, an individual who works with cranial sacral uh, therapy, and they ensure that the, the cranium has sufficient mobility to provide um, mo movement of the cerebral spinal fluid up and down the spine to provide nutrients to all aspects of the, the neurology of the body and the brain. So that, that's my first interest in osteopathy is to do that. But they also arrange conditions for 
the nerves that, under, that are underlying the dura matter that's just underneath the skull to be fluent and free from, some, from binding and from tension, which can also interfere with localized and generalized issues with the underlying neurology of the brain. Okay, great. And so they have tests that will test for all this? Well, osteopathy, they do. Yes, they do. They have very uh, specific training in being able to actually determine the, the integrity of that system. Great. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, Sam, did you have a question? Yes. So I'm realizing that I am double vision. Okay. Now, I'm being beyond our two Venus mount formation. So, um, can you repeat that last part, please, Sam? I suffer an ABM arterial venous malformation. Okay. Yeah, so that can interfere with the, the cranial nerves that are responsible for keeping the eyes lined up. <clears throat> and so, is the double imagery constant in various fields of gaze? Meaning, are the images separate the same distance, no matter if you look up or down? No, or they, they, they happen when I'm tired. Okay, so sometimes the, your eyes are aligned, but sometimes when you get tired, you see double. Yes. Okay, so you might benefit from some either some prism to keep you from being tired, or some prism when you do see double that you can put on temporarily so that you don't see double when the, during those episodes of fatigue. Mm -hmm. Or a third route would be to actually rehabilitate or build up the control that you have over those muscles so that when they do get tired, they don't succumb to the double vision. I see. I have no output and it worked the job of my life. Okay. Well, Thanks, Sam. Uh, I, I hope that was helpful. I have another yeah. hand. Um, Helen. Helen, you can unmute yourself. I can unmute you too. Helen, did you have a question? One second. I don't, I don't see Helen talking. Tim, did you have a question? I have a question. It's Helen. Oh, hi, Helen. Sorry about that. Yeah. I'm sorry I took so long. My main is, is interest is um, handling my hemi, hemi, I can't say it, my left neglect. And I'm, I've been using mirror box therapy to help me with my hand. And I'm really glad to see that maybe the left neglect will be helped by the use of mirror box therapy if I'm paying attention to this time. And I'm curious to know other things that I could be thinking about while working at home. I'm sorry, I can't hear some of what she's saying. What kind, what kind of things do you suggest to your patients to use if they're trying to work on hemi neglect? Okay, so first of all, we try to arrange conditions for there to be ongoing reflexive stimulation of that side of the visual field that you're neglecting. So we can okay. do that, you know, emphasizing that part of your visual field by amplifying the input to that side with prisms. Yoke prisms sometimes can amplify the, the rate that things move and the, uh, the distance that they are from each other. It kind of magnifies and amplifies the movement on that one side to stimulate that side. Mm -hmm. So that might be an ongoing opportunity that's it's kind of a passive approach, but you have it on there all the time. That might be one yeah. thing. The other thing would be to uh, taking a mirror home sometimes and using that mirror on a routine basis to stimulate awareness of that left side. If I think you're saying it's your left side. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so, you very uh, much. You're welcome. So maybe uh, arranging my space so I have to keep looking to the left in my ordinary activities in the day. Right, and you're also yeah. seeing the value and the importance of it. You want to engage in activities that require attention and kind of a survival situation where you have to really do it over there. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm Tim. 
Yes, Dr. Hillier, thank you. This information is great. I have a number of questions I'm gonna to try to combine, uh, really. Um, with regards to diagnosis and um, potential therapies for a, a, a patient who's non-communicative, immobile, um, TBI patient, bedridden patient, um, but has that a visual acuity in terms of um, tracking, you know, in terms of watching, what are the opportunities and limitations uh, for a patient of that sort? Okay, the evaluation is not that difficult because an individual does not need to respond to us vocally uh, in any way for us to know if he needs a specific type of lens for clarity, which it sounds like it's okay. This is your son you're talking about? My daughter, my daughter. Okay, and so um, you, we don't need for her to say anything for us to know what she can see in terms of clarity. Uh, we can also determine if her eyes are aligned or not without her having to respond in an effective way. And so we, we can determine if she's seeing double vision as well without her having to say anything. And we can also provide optical treatments to reestablish coherence of her, her visual system in order to establish that initial connection with her environment. So to make sure that things are clear, that things are single vision, and that she can um, move I don't know to what extent, did you say she can or can't move her eyes laterally? She, she can, um, you know, not with direction, but she can in terms of, again, we don't know, we don't know if she's seeing, we don't know exactly what she's seeing, if she's seeing motion, if she's seeing shadows, if she's seeing, you know, to, to what degree, which kind of leads me to another another well, question. We start, that's probably determinable. There's, there's certain reflexes within the visual system that can reveal the potential for her seeing. One's a simple one called optokinetic nystagmus. That's something we can do. It tells us about the integrity of the midbrain's connection with the visual system. But there's also things called the VEP, or the visually evoked potential, that actually measures from the, the, from the brain whether or not the signal's getting back, and to what degree is she appreciating clarity of that signal. And so we can determine you know, is she really getting information all the way back for visual awareness or not? And, and, and is, also, go ahead. Oh, is, you know, to determine that, is that um, via, you know, some type of functional MRI or to see what activity is going on or is uh, how not a, No, it's not a functional MRI. It's called a VEP. Okay. So it's visually evoked potential. And so okay. recording electrodes are on the back of the head. Got it. And information is brought into the eyes in the form of a checkerboard. And then we record from the back what she sees from the front. Got it. Yeah. And so that's one way to do that. So I, I want to tell you real quick and then I'll, I'll stop. I'm, I'm encouraged. Number one, the whole idea of a team collaborative approach, which is ideally you would like to believe is the norm or could be the norm is extremely, extremely difficult, as you know, as you pointed out, because you have people who are very qualified, very good at what they do, but live in their silos and trying to, to bring them together. Um, I think also where I'm encouraged listening to you, would love to have more conversation at another time, is we run into other therapies, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, that um, without actually getting a, a response to a verbal command, determine that, um, that nothing can be done, that they can't do anything. And so it's really limited in that way. So, um, I mean, it's encouraging that there are things that can be done without necessarily being verbal or being mobile to. Right. Well, you can even sometimes determine an individual's response to vocal information by looking at their pupils, you know, because there's a, there's a neurological, physiological response, an emotional response to certain input, whether it be vocal or visual, that's reflected in the pupils. So if a pupil changes size, that's telling you something that there's, there's activity and there's a, a response to what's being spoken. Thank you. You're welcome. Wow, thanks Thanks for the questions, Tim. Um, we did have uh, um, 
J uh, Justina put up um, a question. I'm not sure I understand it, but Dr. Hillier, maybe you can add some um, insight to this. She said, Dr. Hillier, I, I have some double vision, but also brain tumor behind my left eye. I try to do exercises to help open up the left eyelid that's down. And I, I think that's a question is, uh, you know, can she do exercises to help open up the left eyelid that's down in that kind of circumstance? Okay, well, it, I would need more information to answer that really specifically. Uh, but, yeah. you know, there, the, if, the eye, if the nerve that's traveling to that muscle that lifts the eyelid up is disrupted mechanically, then there's a limitation to the degree that you'll learn to move the eyelid up. Of course, just because there's a mechanical interference to the nerve that moves the muscle to lift the eyelid. If it's, um, but to the extent that it's doable, like for example, if we could determine what's the maximum height the lid can move, then we know that at least that's the maximum, and we can you can work toward developing that maximum through exercises, just like you might do with physical therapy with other muscles in the body. But it's pretty challenging to do that, and many times people ultimately have to have a surgery to lift the eyelid and to um, bring that out of the way because it, the muscle just isn't sufficiently strong to lift it up. So it depends on lots of different things. If, if it's a neurological insult to the nerve that is more like swelling or if the tumor is going to be removed, you know, then recovering function is a possibility, but that's a, a peripheral nerve. Some it's a peripheral motor nerve that sometimes has a hard time recovering function. Sure. With. Thank you for that. Um, I have a question uh, here from, uh, or a comment from Heidi Lerner in the chat here. Uh, she's saying, um, Dr. Hillier, could you discuss visual memory and how it may be improved? Okay, so there's different kinds of visual memory. And so it depends on what kind of memory we're talking about. There's, there's um, episodic memory, there's um, procedural memory, there's all kinds of memory. There's memory for facts. And so it just depends on what kind of memory we're thinking about here. So visual spatial memory is memory that is derived from physical experience in, in three-dimensional space. So to help reestablish visual spatial memory, that is to know where you've been, where you are, and where you might want to go, that's, that's called the visual spatial sketch pad of visual working memory. That requires a reestablishment or a reenactment of movement through dynamic three-dimensional space. So an OT in collaboration with possibly vision rehabilitation, possibly vision uh, or physical therapy, possibly with a lot of different people, physically moving through space and logging in either vocally or sketching where you've been, where you are and where you're going, possibly even with a a map in front of you, a, a compass, possibly, depending on your cognitive level. That movement through space helps visual spatial memory. But um, episodic memory is knowledge of where you've been. And so that depends on to what extent there might be damage in the hippocampus and these other areas that are responsible for the neurological recapturing of previous episodic memories. Or, or laying down new memories too. So it kind of depends on the type of injury uh, and where that's located. Uh, it determines the degree with, or, or ease with which that kind of memory can be recovered. Uh, working with a cognitive therapist and a speech and language pathologist, you can get back into recovering some semantic memory for linguistic information. So being able to um, remember how to spell words and being able to uh, come up with the words you want for the visual images that you're looking at. These kind of things, that, that's a collaboration between speech and language and vision rehab, and possibly other professionals as well, possibly OT, depending on what we're working on. And, and cognitive rehabilitative therapists are a big part of this community as well. So yeah. it's, a, it's a hard question to ask because there's so many different kinds of memory. There's so many different kinds of visual memory, and it depends on where the injury is and what we're looking for in terms of a functional recovery. Yeah, and you know, thank you for that answer though. And, and one of the things that occurs to me is, is you know, you're talking about that team approach, right? And, and really yeah. having that, that team surrounding you. And you know, as, as I talk to people that are 
you know, going through the, the journey of recovery from brain injury, you know, um, I, I find that, that people really um, have some difficulty in the level of advocacy, you know, that they need to, you know, provide for themselves, right? And, uh, and that can be a challenge because, you know, you may not automatically have your primary care physician or whomever that's creating this team around you. And so there's a level of advocacy, I think, that, um, that's required to really get the, the right medical professionals involved. Right. Yeah. Um, we, have a, we have another question here, a um, couple of questions uh, from Pat. Uh, can depth perception problems and a feeling of rocking back and forth and side to side, which makes walking on uneven surfaces difficult, be helped with vision therapy? Uh, it depends uh, if the walking on uneven surfaces has to do with the foot's inability to recognize the position of the foot, then it's sending um, ambiguous signals to the brain about when and where the body is relative to gravity. So if it's, if it's a foot issue, then vision therapy no. is not going to be the therapeutic intervention. That would be a podiatrist yeah. that would look at that. It's more like almost a vertical kind of problem, but and it's kind of recent and it's a depth perception, maybe off by three or four four inches. And I've had uh, vestibular, you know, evaluation. I don't think it's it's that. So, but it seems to be a, a vision thing. It seems like it gets worse if I put on a certain pair of glasses. But okay. um, but now it's just getting kind of worse where I'm not even um, just walking back and forth. I can feel this kind of you know like that. Okay. Yeah. So if, if you ruled out the vestibular contribution to this experience, uh, then you've really ruled out what we call the, the saccule, which is the part of the vestibular inner ear that's responsible for up and down movement and lateral movement. And so it's not the semicircular canals as much. It's the linear uh, experience of movement, such as when you get off an elevator and you feel like you're still going up and down. Is it kind of like that? It feels almost like being on a like a boat and the boat's moving back and forth and side to side. So kind of like, and it's okay. it's a pretty it's kind of it's recent. It's been like maybe three last three months or so. Okay, so that experience is a two way street. There's there's the vestibular contribution <laughs> to balance disorders and there's a visual contribution to balance disorders. And then the third one is the integration of the two. So if you've had your vestibular system looked at and it seems like there's integrity there and everything's okay then it could be two remaining issues. One is the integration of the two or a primary visual induced balance issue. So when you put on different pairs of glasses, that tells you that in large part, it's a visually induced issue because if you just change your glasses, then you have that experience. And the only thing that's changed is your visual input. So the type of lenses that you have are very important. There's a, something called a base curve. There's pupillary distance where your line of sight is. If you're wearing a progressive lens, for example, in a bifocal, that can induce problems. So if, you, if you're wearing a progressive lens bifocal that slowly changes power over time when you look down. Yeah, I'm not wearing that, but. Okay, well, it, yeah, that kind of lens can really cause spatial distortion, which then signals to your vestibular system that something's happening when it's really not. And so by getting lenses that are just purely for distance only, yeah, I can sometimes help that. Okay, yeah, okay. So, I mean, I, I have glasses that are for purely for, for distance. And what I'm finding is, like, I'm trying to step on something and maybe my foot's like, I think it's about three inches closer than it actually is. Is yeah. that something to help with prisms? Or is that just a different oh, yeah. than the, the, yeah. the, the eye, you know, how well one eye can see compared to another? Well, they, yes, because the, the lenses, by definition, alter the perceived distance things are from you. So they, they'll cause things to look as though they're further away or closer than they really are. And that can cause significant disruption in terms of up and down stair, stepping off curves, going up stairs, things like that. Absolutely. So should I see optometrist or vision therapy or what, what, where, where would my next step be? I, I would go to a developmental or a rehabilitative optometrist. What part of town are you in? I'm in North County. My real problem is um, I'm of an HMO with scripts. And okay. it took me a really long time to find somebody who did any kind of vision therapy at all. What do you call it? Orthoped, orthoped, orthodox? I can't remember what the person was called. And Orthopic. she's gone on uh, pregnancy leave, and I, they don't have anybody else. Okay. So I guess I'd have to pay for it myself. So I guess it doesn't really matter where I am. I could drive. Okay. Yeah, so there's good people up in North County that you can go to. And 
if you contact me, I can let you know where they are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Got a, got a couple more questions here, and we got a few more minutes. We'll probably take questions to, just till eleven thirty. Um, Tim, did you have another question? Real quick, because uh, Kurt, you touched on the advocacy uh, piece, and Dr. Hillier again, this whole idea of the team approach. Who is the individual or the professional who, in essence, would serve as a pseudo project manager, for example? I mean, in terms of stepping back, looking at the issues, looking at all the moving parts, looking at all the pieces, because as, a, um, as an advocate, as maybe a parent, as an advocate, your knowledge is limited. And you again, you're talking to one person, then you're talking to another, and someone can suggest. But someone who has that, that breadth of experience that can say, this is a time where we need to bring in the nutritionist. This is the time we need to bring in the, the physical therapist or the occupational therapist or the podiatrist or, or whatever, but in essence serves in that role. Well, the, in a hospital setting, when somebody's in a, uh, a rehab clinic, for example, it's the physiatrist. Okay, that's that's basically, basically their title is a physiatrist. Right. right, on right. The, on the East Coast, they call them physiatrists, right. okay? But um, on the West Coast, they're physiatrists. Typically, they're, they're kind of the coordinators of all the different medical services that are available and all the rehabilitative services that are available. Mm -hmm. And depending on their experience and their, their, the range of uh, knowledge that they have about re rehab, they'll be able to do that for you. Okay. I was wondering that if that was, I'm familiar with that and I actually have met with a physiatrist once. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Um, a couple other questions in the, in the few minutes we uh, have left here. Um, so after, uh, one second, after, I think this is probably a fairly common question, after a severe traumatic brain injury, does double vision sometimes improve on its own? How many months, years does healing take place? And uh, you know, I think that's a that's a difficult question to answer, right? In terms of uh, you know how many months, years, but we you've talked about brain plasticity. We hear a lot about that. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, what you typically hear the the blanket response to that typically is if it's not better in six months, then it's probably not going to get better. Yeah, I mean that's what you hear, and but I think that's kind of a an easy way out, from my opinion, to say that. I think things can be facilitated and things can be known much sooner. So for example, if you have double vision and you're you know, one month out from your injury, why not treat it now instead of wait and hope that it gets better? And you can, you can treat it now with Fresnel prisms like I showed you before. They're just really good. You cut them out with a piece of scissors, you put them on the glasses and there's no more double vision. It costs about $20 and you're done. Now it's not that easy, but it's, it's not that difficult either and so, when I went to the uh, rehab hospital at Alvarado, I would just have a big kit of those things and I would be cutting those out and putting them on people's glasses all the time. And so, and patching an eye is, I know that um, there's a, an attendee here whose son has his eye patched and that sometimes is necessary, but instead of a patch, sometimes a prism can redirect the light into that turned eye to reestablish single vision instead of just patching the eye and, and, and letting it do its thing. Because the brain wants to recover, and if you give it an opportunity, a little bit of help to recover, it likes that, and it takes that on as an opportunity to do whatever it needs to do to recapture fusion of those images. So um, engaging in activities that obligate the eye to move. So for example, if this eye is out of alignment, and I cover this eye, and I look straight ahead at the computer, and I turn my head like this, it's my vestibular system that's driving the movement of my eye, which is a very primitive system, which is where we start. So we just want the, the reflexive stimulation of the brain to cause the eye to move. Then later on, we'll have the eye move on a target. And then all the while, we're supporting that with prisms that help reestablish eye alignment to the target with the fellow eye. So in other words, what I'm guessing, what I'm saying is that um, Six, maybe six months, if nothing happens, then nothing's going to happen. But that's if you don't do anything. If you, 
engage the individual with all kinds of activities, I think that timeline is much different. And in the meantime, if their eye never does get aligned with the fellow eye, at least you have an opportunity to have coherence in your visual world that's not double vision and confusing. Yeah, good response, thank you. And a couple, a couple more questions here. Um, and uh, this one I may not be able to, to say correctly, but uh, let's ask, uh, can there ever be a confusion in diagnosis between a visual neglect and homogeneous hem hemophilia? And you can probably see that as well, so you can say it better than me, I don't know what that is. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, there's a lot of confusion between uh, homonymous hemianopsia, which is a, a field loss to one side of your visual field in each eye, and visual neglect. So it's, it's sometimes challenging to discern between those two, uh, but there are ways to do that. And so it's important to know that. You can also have um, you know, both together sometimes. So it's really a complex situation, but it, you can discern the difference between the two and then the functional resolution is different for each one. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And um, someone asked here, um, and I think they just sent it to me, uh, just bear with me. Um, oh, okay, now I don't don't see it now. I think that comment disappeared. Oh, if balance is an issue, what's the name of the doctor uh, to go see? And I think we're talking maybe, are we talking about vestibular, um, you know, therapies and things like that? What, do you have any comments about that? Because I know that you deal with balance issues, right? Yeah, balance issues are probably the, the biggest multidisciplinary group that you yeah, want to go to. So you want to rule out uh, organic neurological injury first. And so I like Ian Purcell personally. Um, he seems to be really comprehensive in his assessments of the integrity of the, the, the vestibular system. He rules out tumor, stroke, you know, injury. And so he's a good person, I think, to go to right off the bat. What's his discipline? Uh, neuroautology. Okay. Now, there's also Dr. Viri at UCSD who does the same thing. And so those are two people that you want to get confirmation that there's, there's no disease or injury, or if there is, that's treated. And then you want to get into functional resolution. So there's a lot of different people with functional resolution. Most of them are physical therapists. And so... Um, I can I can send you a bunch of people's names there too, probably, and, and the, around the county that can help you with that. But most physical therapists are pretty good at what they do when it comes to vision rehab. I mean, to vestibular rehab, and I like working with the ones that want to work with me because it's a collaborative effect. Yeah, you know, um, I'll I'll do some vision therapy sometimes, and what I notice is that some physical therapists are also doing some vision therapy, but it, they're they're at odds with each other. So we need to synchronize our care so that it's most effective. That's a good, good answer. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And uh, yeah, and if you, any uh, list of folks that are uh, trusted professionals that uh, you could send to me, you know, we uh, have calls all the time and, and certainly, you know, balance is uh, something that we hear a lot of in terms of a concern that uh, survivors have. So um, okay. Appreciate that. And um, then someone had a question here. June had a question. Does PRISM work well after a person's had a stroke? Uh, she said they, they gave her a headache. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes PRISMs don't work. And some, just like any medication, sometimes they're the wrong medication or they just simply don't work. Um, and so, yeah, PRISM's not a panacea. It has to be used very specifically and, and the power has to be very carefully prescribed. So sure, I mean, if you have prism to compensate for double vision, it has to be very carefully applied. If you have prism to reestablish movement through space because you have a visual midline shift, that, that too has to be carefully prescribed. And if you have prism because of homonymous hemianopsia, that's a different kind of prism. So it just depends on the prism and the nature of the problem and the amount of prism and the type of prism. So yes, by all means, I've had patients who I prescribe prism with and I think it's gonna be great and it's gonna solve all their problems and they come back next week and they have horrendous headaches. And I understand that. And so you have to be very careful with it and you have to prescribe it uh, in a way that's kind of a gentle approach to, for maximal efficiency, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much for that. And I, you know, I just have a comment in the, in the medical world. Sometimes, you know, we talk about, um, you know, bedside manner and I, I can't imagine a, a better quote unquote bedside manner than, than what you have. And, you know, your willingness to spend some time here today and answer these questions um, is just incredible. And.